best parts about being a pastor is getting to hang out with children and youth. And one of the best parts of being a pastor is getting to watch all of you interact with children and youth, especially when they're your own. I know that sometimes when you're in church and you have your kids and your youth around, it can get a little awkward and loud. I know this because I have been there. Let's face it, I am still there. The only difference is is I can't get to my children as fast as you can right now. I get it. There was a time when I remember so vividly, I was sitting in church in a pew and I was listening to the message. It was actually my husband's church and I was listening to him speak and I was really trying to look like I was listening. And I was leaned in, I was like, "Mm, yes, yes. And all the while I had my hand around my daughter's ankle because she was trying to crawl under the pews. I remember another time and I was listening to my husband preach and I got there and my son said, Mom, we want all the friends to sit together. There were six six six-year-olds who wanted to be big boys and sit together like the youth sit together. And all the other moms were like, yeah, sit with Mary and she's a preacher, it'll be great. And so we decided to put all those little six-year-old boys right behind me. They were pretty quiet. I mean, I could see them doing something, but they were quiet, so I left them alone. And right in the middle of the sermon, you know what always happens in the middle of the message. Right there in the middle of the sermon, I saw the corner of my eye, my son's hand go up and throw it. It was a paper airplane, and somehow my maternal instincts took over, and I just simply raised my hand, grabbed it, and put it right back down. For a good 30 seconds, like it was silence. And then everybody did what you just did, and all the adults and all the parents started laughing. (laughs) Having kids in church can be awkward. They've got the squirmies, and it's noisy, and it's loud. I am here for it. I welcome it, and I honor it. Because starting today, things look a little differently. Starting today, Sunday school and worship will no longer run simultaneously. We have a 10 o'clock hour for Sunday school, for children, for youth, and for all of the adults. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a time of worship. If you want to go to a Sunday school and you're an adult and you feel like, I'm not really ready for a whole Sunday school, I don't know about that, then we have a community group. We want you to find a place to plug in. The community groups are six-week classes. They follow our school break schedule. It's a great way to get started to meet people. That 10 o'clock hour is a time for everyone of all ages to begin to have a different kind of small group and community experience. And then we come together, all of us, and we worship together. And I love it because if we don't worship together as families, then we might miss out on the amazing talents of our children like Lottie Mo. And if we're not all worshiping together, we may miss out on seeing all of the youth sit together. And if we're not worshiping together, then we miss out on you checking on the kids that you're regularly looking for. We miss out on making memories from Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. And so when we worship as a family, I know it is going to be loud. I know. Thank you. They're going to be crying and tears and laughter and so many memories. It's going to be wonderful. And so I thank you. I thank you for taking a time to learn and a time to be in worship. But the one thing I'm a little nervous about having children in the service, in the worship, the questions they're going to ask me. I'm a little nervous about the questions that the children are going to ask me and ask possibly you on the way home. You see, I know through many children's messages I've done and spending time at church schools and devotions, I know that sometimes the hardest questions come from people who are under two feet tall. 
When children ask you a question, it's usually a very literal question, and they want a very literal answer. So when a five-year-old says, where does God live? And I say, in your heart, you better believe there are going to be a lot of follow-up questions. And when a five-year-old says, "Uh, did Jesus have any brothers and sisters, and did they fight a lot? You need to be prepared. I've had a five-year-old before look at me and say, why can't God fix this? We all have very literal questions, and we want very literal answers to them. This past year, I was um, able to do a chapel service with the kids at RUMCK, our own church school here in the sanctuary building. And it's such a sweet chapel time. But at the very end, whenever it's time for the kids to go back to their classrooms, they play this beautiful song. And one at a time, the classes have to stand up and in a perfect little row, go back to their classes. You know how that works. In this one little classroom, this little class, they stood up together and they started to walk out as the song went. And I saw it. I watched this little boy. He didn't like his place in the line. So without anybody he thought paying attention, he just kind of left his line to get in the line leader. And somehow the teacher knew. And so the teacher very calmly turned around very gently put her hands on his shoulder and walked him all the way back, all the while just to sing in that little goodbye song, put him in the back of the line. And he was miserable. <laughs> he walked right past me and he looked right at me and he goes, why do I have to be last? I didn't know what to do. So very quickly, I just pointed at the teacher. I was like, I don't know, I think it's her fault. <laughs> When I was in youth group, we always had a day. It was called Ask a Preacher Anything You Want Day. I loved it. I would come with the best questions. And we would get there and the preacher would come in the room and the youth director would say, okay, it's time to ask the preacher anything. Only you can't ask about scripture, God, or Jesus because we don't have time for that. (laughs) Today's your big day. You get to ask a preacher anything you want right now. So in your mind, think about it. Have you ever wanted to ask a preacher a question because I'm about to let you do it? Now notice, I am not saying this is a Q&A. This is not a question and answer. I'm not gonna answer any of your questions. I'm only gonna let you ask them, okay? So get ready. What have you always, always wanted to ask a preacher? Go for it. Really? Okay, what do you want? How's God born? born? Definitely not answering that one today. (laughs) What else? Good question. What else? Anything. It can be anything you want. How long did Jesus live? live? Good one. Yes, anybody. Popcorn them out. Scream them out to me. What do you want to ask a preacher? When was the earth made? Told you they're hard. What else? Did Jesus have brothers or sisters? Anything else you ever wanted to ask a preacher? Okay. (laughs) So does a preacher ever have to go to the bathroom when they're preaching? That's a good question. Okay, one more. What was first, Adam and Eve or dinosaurs? What else? Did God make aliens? 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 All right. Oh, sorry. What was the first word? What was the first word? What did God make? Good. Good questions. What did God make? What came first? Which color? Okay. I like it. I'll go with it. Why 
invited Mary and Joseph ride on a donkey. See, some of the hardest questions come from people under two feet tall. Do you know what? Okay, one more. Why did the people wave palms at Jesus? If Jesus were standing right here, would your questions change? If Jesus were standing right here in front of me, think about all the questions you would want to ask. There was one group of people who got an opportunity to ask Jesus anything they wanted. And the question they asked Jesus was the same question that a five-year-old from our church asked at a chapel service. And the Gospel of Mark tells us what it is. They went on from there and they passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask. Now right there, if you are a student, I want you to hear what they just said. Jesus was teaching the disciples, the students, And they had no idea what he was saying. And so they were afraid to ask. It's kind of like sitting in a science class or a math class or social studies class. And you don't want to be the guy that like raises his hand. He's like, excuse me. You don't want to be the girl to raise your hand and ask any questions. That's what's happening. They don't understand, but they're afraid. And then they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? So here we are. We are in the house. This means that they are not in the crowd. This means they are private. It's just Jesus and the disciples and everyone else is outside. So they have like this perfect moment, this very intimate moment with Jesus. And do you know what they said? They were silent. For on the way, they had actually been arguing with one another. Who is the greatest? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes One such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Who's the first, the greatest, and the best of all time? None of us want to be the last one. None of us. When's the last time that we were in traffic, which all of a sudden has picked up greatly? When was the last time any of us were like, oh no, it's good. I'll sit at this yellow light and you can go ahead of me. I'll be the last one there. Really, I don't need to merge. Y'all go right on ahead. When's the last time we passed up a promotion so that someone else could go ahead of us? When's the last time we gave up our week as line leader and gave it to our friend and we were like, no, I'm good. You go ahead. You can take my week. We just finished the 2020 Olympics. And one of the many goals of the Olympics was to find the fastest man alive in the world. I promise you, as soon as they announced the fastest man, someone was ready to dispute it. Well, you know who wasn't there. You know what athletes couldn't be there, right? You know this condition or that condition. We are always asking, how can we be the best and the first and the greatest? And the answer comes from the Gospel of Mark. And Mark uses a typical Markan pattern to answer. Mark uses the same pattern three different times. This is the second time in Mark's gospel that it's used. But the pattern goes like this. There's a prediction, 
a response, and then an instruction. A prediction, a response, and then an instruction. The prediction. Jesus predicted that he would be betrayed. It's the exact same word as used with the betrayal of Judas. So Jesus is predicting very quickly that he will be betrayed by a friend. And the response of the disciples, they don't get it. They don't understand. So what do they do? They fight about it. They start to argue about it. They start to argue and worry about their own position and their own status. They want to know who's the crowd going to follow next? Who's going to be the next boss? Who's the most qualified? And that's what's so funny because really none of them are really qualified to do it. Right before this part of Mark, right before this argument, a man brought there his son said, my son is hurting. Can you please heal him? And the disciples tried and they couldn't even do it. Right after this argument, if you keep reading, right after this, there is a man who literally is casting out demonic spirits. The disciples go over and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not qualified. You're not a disciple. You can't do this. You better stop. Stop doing that. We can't do it, so you can't do it. And Jesus says, You have been with me. You have watched. You don't understand. You're still arguing. And Jesus' response is to bend down and scoop up a child and say, whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. In our mind, we have this beautiful image We see all of these beautiful children and they're dressed in all their Sunday school clothes and they've got their teeth brushed and their hair brushed and they all got to church without anyone asking or arguing about anything. And we see in our minds Jesus just like scooping up the children saying, I love children, protect them. That is not at all this vision. That's not what happened at all. (laughs) Jesus' instruction so all the fighting is to say, you must be a servant of all, even to these. In the first century, children were looked differently than they are in the 21st century. In the first century, there was a class system. And a servant of all was the lowest in the class. Because that was the person who truly had to serve every single person in the community. And Jesus said, if you want to be the best, then you have to go lower than that. Children in the first century, they had no control. They had no authority. They contributed nothing. And so Jesus is saying, if you want to be the greatest, if you want to be the first, then you have to take care of the people everyone else is ignoring. You have to take care of the people others are ignoring. There was a kindergartner, and her assignment was to draw a picture of her family. So she went up and she presented her picture to her class. And on the paper, there were just a bunch of lines and little bitty circles. And she said, this is my mommy, this is my daddy, this is my brother. And everybody just kind of stared at it. And finally, it dawned on the teacher. She's like, let me guess. Is your family tall? (laughs) Her family looked very differently from where she was. All she saw were legs. There's a great story about a Presbyterian pastor. She was with a group of adults and a group of children, and they were at a seminary as a Presbyterian seminary called Princeton. And they got to an elevator and the elevator doors opened and out walked a very famous Presbyterian pastor named Fred Rogers. The one and only, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, Mr. Rogers. And as soon as Mr. Rogers walked out of the elevator, all of the adults began to swarm him and ask him questions. And do you know what he did? Mr. Rogers stopped 
and bent all the way down and addressed every single child first. And after he had talked to every child first, then he stood up to address all of the other adults. That was his pattern. Everyone who knew Mr. Rogers would tell you that was his pattern. And that is what made him one of the greatest interpreters of the world for children. And that's really our answer. Jesus is telling us we must stop and bend down and see the world from a different vantage point. The world looks very, very differently when you see it through the eyes of someone else, when you see it from a lower perspective. Because the world looks very differently when you feel like you are the one who is being ignored or hated or treated unfairly. When was the last time that we saw a family who's suffering from economic instability or food insecurity and we stopped and saw the world as they saw it? When was the last time we saw a teenager who was struggling with an eating disorder or who was a cutter or who was making terrible choices because they needed somebody to pay attention to them? Do we stop and see the world from their vantage point? What about a family who's taking care of multi-generations in their home and they're struggling just to keep up or even pay attention to their partner? What about families who are struggling with some kind of addiction? Or what about people who are struggling to be themselves and to be honest with each other? Do we stop and see the world as they see it? As they see it? Only when we are stopping and paying attention is Jesus saying we can be welcoming to him. Pick anything you want, any theological issue or not. See where the prediction was that you didn't understand. Then see how we fight about it. And then hear God saying, you must include the very ones the fighting impacts the most. It works out almost every time. Pay attention to the things we hear. Pay attention to the things we're fighting about and include the very ones that the fighting impacts the most. So maybe this year, it's time that we raise our hand and start asking questions. And maybe it's time that we be the bystander to stand up for somebody. And maybe it's time we're the ones that ignore no one. Because then and only then can we be the greatest interpreters of God's grace for the entire world? So maybe this year, we stop and we let God ask us a question. For whom will you stop your race? So we're just about all set for the second heat in the women's 5,000 meters. All eyes will be on Almaz Ayana, a new world record holder over 10,000 meters. Nikki Hamlin there, she's had a Commonwealth medal over the years. D'Agostino of the USA giving the camera a little wave. loser spot. Ayana is now leaving the back straight and the rest of the pack has just entered the back straight. Oops, there's a fall at the back of the field here. There's a couple of runners down. 
and the other athlete who's fallen has decided to stop back there with her and she is in a lot of trouble, D'Agostino. It's D'Agostino and Nicky Hamlin. Hamlin stumbles on the inside line and then a really nasty fall and an ankle problem there for D'Agostino. The American was initially showing more concern and then realised how much pain she was in. D'Agostino is going to finish this race. It's going to be a very, very painful mile for the American. Brave, brave performance to carry on. D'Agostino is being passed now by Almazayana. It really will be an emotional finish to her race, which will come way after the top five qualifiers. Abby D'Agostino, tears of frustration, and maybe hopefully one day she will look back on this as a moment of great pride, embraced by the woman whose aspirations also came to an end. The ankle clearly hurting. as she decided to finish the race. And that is the very embodiment of the Olympic spirit alive and well here in Rio in 2016. Amen. There's a new race that is starting and it's called the school year. <laughs> And I know that most of you have already started it. And so we're going to do a time of blessing, a blessing for backpacks, a, less, a blessing for students. And so if you're ready, if you want to do this, um, I invite you, if you are a student or if you're a teacher or a faculty member or an administrator of anything to do with schools, higher education, all the way to preschool, come down and you can just, you can just circle yourselves. So go ahead. It's all right. You can sit or you can stand. There you go. Thank you. And you just come. Come right over here. Just like line up, line up. Just line up right here on the carpet. Thank you. Thank you. And when you get, if you're not comfortable, if you don't want to come down, it's okay. You can stand up where you are. You can stand up where you are if you don't want to come down. Students, thank you. Thank you. And so we're going to have a blessing. If you have somebody standing up next to you and you know them and you live with them, you can go ahead and touch their back if you want to or something like that. But let's go ahead and let's have a time of blessing. After we say our prayer here, our band is going to sing our last song. And as they sing our last song, I'm going to pass out these tags for your backpacks or computer bags or whatever you have, okay? Okay. All right, let's have a prayer blessing. Gracious and holy Lord, I thank you for this next school year. And I ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on all of these students in this room. Bless every person that has to go to school. May you give them good encouragement May you help them have a sense of achievement with the end of every day. And Lord, if there's ever a day they are feeling discouraged or disappointed, may you remind them they are one day closer to the next summer break. <laughs> and Lord, for all of the teachers, all of the educators, all of the people who help make school happen from our cafeteria workers and our maintenance crews, May you bless them and may you help them to feel a sense of achievement at the end of their day. And at the end of their day, if they're ever discouraged or worried, may you remind our adults that they're a day closer to the next break. May you be with every backpack, every notebook, every water bottle, every fidget, everything we use to learn, Lord. May you bless it. May you make it good. And may you help it to make good choices for us. May we have a sense of friendship with each other in this chapel so that we can turn around and be friends to those who need it the most. 
We thank you for making us a church family, and we thank you for all that we will learn together. May we as a church continue to support one another and be with one another so that we can be along the journey the whole time. When one of us stops, we'll all stop together so that we may finish together. Amen. Amen. Amen.